Bees first appeared on Earth 130 million years ago, and they outlived dinos. What helped them survive for so long is an incredibly complex structure of their society and teamwork. Each bee has its own role and responsibility. Some of them build and repair their home, some bees protect it, others clean the hive and get food. But what if you could sneak into a hive and figure out how this whole system works? What would you see inside? For some mysterious reason, it's easy for you to get past the guards. But if you were a bee from another colony, they wouldn't let you in without a fight. The guard bees look rather intimidating. They stand on their back four legs at the hive's entrance, their front legs raised in the air. These bees inspect every insect entering the hive with their antennae and front legs. Each hive has its own odor. And the guards can understand if a bee belongs to their colony by smelling it. Only the bees that live in the hive can get inside. Suddenly, you see something strange. One of the guard bees has detected an intruder. An alien bee must have mistakenly tried to enter the wrong hive. But it's carrying a load of nectar. And the guard lets it in. Apparently, they don't mind accepting free gifts of food, even from strangers. You feel too curious to linger there any longer. The hive has only one entrance. You notice that the walls around it look strange. You take a closer look and understand that it's coated with a thin layer of some substance. It's propolis, hardened plant resin produced by bees. It helps fight infections and cures different health problems. A bit further, you can see countless honeycombs. They're densely packed hexagonal cells made of beeswax. Bees use them to store food, pollen, and honey. That's where they keep eggs, larvae, and pupae. Honeycombs are fixed to the walls of the hive. They stretch from top to bottom and are even attached to the sides. But you spot narrow passageways along the comb edges. Bees use them to move around the hive. You might also be able to squeeze through one of these tunnels. After exploring the place, you figure out that bees store honey in the upper part of the comb. Beneath, there are cells that contain pollen. Then, there are cells used for keeping eggs with future worker bees. And at the very bottom, there are drone eggs. Of course, your ultimate goal is to see the queen bee, but it's not that easy to find her. First, you come across lots of other bees. Most of them are workers. They make up the largest part of the hive's population, and they're all ladies. Each of them has its own task. The most common of them is foraging. You spot a bee leaving a hive and decide to follow it. The queen can wait a bit. You want to see how bees provide food for the hive. The bee is buzzing ahead of you. After visiting a couple of flowers, it suddenly starts wiggling while hovering in one place. Ah, that's the famous bee dance. That's how bees communicate. Once a forager finds a perfect supply of nectar, it starts to perform a very precise dance. It consists of a series of straight lines and figure eights. Throughout the dance, the bee is also shaking its wings. How long the dance lasts means how far away from the hive the nectar is. Every 75 milliseconds is another 330 feet to the distance. And how intense the dance is depends on the richness of the source of the nectar. The stronger the waggle is, the more nectar the bee has found. And there's also the angle of the dance. It shows the direction of the nectar in relation to the sun. Your bee must have found tons of nectar. It's practically vibrating. Suddenly, it starts flying back to the hive. You follow it. There, the bee does a shake dance in front of the other worker bees. This is how it tells other bees they need to go foraging right away. You decide to stay behind and just watch what will happen. Soon, the bees return. They've brought back a lot of nectar that needs to be ripened into honey. Your bee does a tremble dance this time. It's shaking its legs in a way that makes its body tremble all over. This little dance makes other workers get down to process the nectar. It's time for you to resume your search. You dive back into the hive and begin to squeeze through small passageways. You come across the cells where worker bees begin their lives as eggs. It takes a bee 21 days to develop from an egg into a full-grown worker. The first task of this new worker is to clean the cell where it grew. The cell then becomes a nursery for a new egg. And the bee looks after this egg. Later, it feeds the larva and keeps it warm. During the next stage of its life, when it's 12 to 20 days old, the bee starts doing chores around the hive. It produces wax, stores pollen and nectar, builds the comb, guards the entrance, and so on. When the bee turns 20 days old, it becomes a forager. It looks for and delivers pollen, nectar, and tree resin to make propolis. The bee also brings water. Bees need it for drinking and cooling the hive. At one point, 
do you see something that looks like a hospital room? There, worker bees look after those that feel unwell. The doctors bring them different types of honey, depending on their infection. If there's no other way, they remove a sick bee from the hive. It helps to prevent the entire colony from getting ill. And then, there are also temperature control bees. The temperature in the hive is usually around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. It's crucial to keep it this way, not hotter, not colder. Otherwise, the eggs won't hatch. You see a group of bees and instantly understand they're temperature bees. Apparently, the temperature in the hive has dropped, and now the bees are trying to warm it up. They're vibrating in a special way, which raises their body temperature. And you can feel the air around you become a bit warmer. And if they needed to cool the hive, they would go and gather some water droplets. Then they would bring this water on their backs. Once in the hive, the temperature bees would buzz their wings very fast, making the water evaporate and lower the temperature. You move further and soon come across a bee you haven't seen before. It has huge eyes, a large body, and no stinger. It's a drone, the only kind of male bee in the hive. Drones don't have any foraging tools either. Their only purpose is to mate with the queen and care for her. The drone's life isn't too long. For one thing, if this bee manages to mate with the queen, it never survives the process. And if there's a food shortage or winter is coming, worker bees usually kick drones out of the hive and don't let them back in. Wow, that's harsh. You keep going until you finally notice a nursery. There, you spot a bee that is twice the size of a worker bee. Your quest has come to an end. That's the queen. This bee is the most important one for the hive, because it's the only bee that can lay eggs. Despite her title, the queen doesn't actually rule, and her brain is smaller than that of a worker bee. But she produces special pheromones that influence the mood of the entire hive. The queen also gives birth to every single bee in the colony. When the queen is still a larva, worker bees feed her royal jelly. That's a goop with super high sugar content. A larger cell, along with such a diet, leads to a bigger body and the future queen's ability to emit the pheromones. When the queen has mated with drones, she returns to the hive. Three days later, she starts laying eggs and never stops. She works especially hard in the spring, laying one egg every 20 seconds. No wonder that later in the year, the colony already has a population of 30,000 to 60,000 bees. But wait, something strange is happening here. A group of worker bees, in fact lots of them, might be half the colony, leave the hive with the queen leading them. It means the colony has become too big. The queen goes outside for the first time since mating, and the whole swarm sets off in search of a new home. Back in the hive, a new queen hatches from an egg eight days later. Lions, elephants, and bears! Oh my! Three of the most beautiful yet intimidating members of the animal kingdom. But what intimidates these creatures, if anything? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. How about we start with the universally recognized king of the jungle, the lion? We'll get to the elephants in a moment, but there's actually one in the room. You know, the one that claims that a certain jungle cat is afraid of the most vital substance known to man? A small hint, it covers 70% of Earth's surface. So, is it true? Is the ferocious lion afraid of water? It's actually a myth. Lions enjoy taking a dip in the water because it allows them to cool off. This makes sense if you think about the climates the creatures have to face. Temperatures in a savanna climate range from 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know all of us humans hit the beach whenever the weather is like that. So why should we expect anything different from the lion? Especially given that the creatures typically carry around between 280 and 420 pounds of weight as well as a thick coat of fur. The ironic thing about this whole lions are afraid of water myth is that they're actually fantastic swimmers. The same goes for all of your other favorite large cats from these warm weather climates, such as tigers, leopards, jaguars, and ocelots. It's actually large cats from cold climates that do their best to avoid water. This applies to such felines as bobcats, lynxes, and snow leopards. The latter lives in places like the cold alpine tundra biome. That's a rocky mountainous area. Temperatures there, on average, get as low as 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it makes perfect sense that these big, cold weather cats despise water. Getting their fur coats wet would dampen their chances of staying warm. 
pun intended. I don't think you have to look too far to piece together where this lions are afraid of water myth comes from. In fact, there's a good chance for some of you watching this video that the reason is near your computer screen right now, jumping around and causing mischief. That's right, we may have jumped ourselves to a conclusion that certain behavioral aspects of our own pet cats would match that of a lion. House cats, though related to all the previously mentioned big cats, are not actually directly descended from them. They instead have developed over millions of years from a single wild ancestor that still exists in the wild today, the Near Eastern Wildcat. As water is not plentiful in the Middle East, these cats were not exposed to it to any great degree. Like their descendants, they only appreciate it as a food source. As you likely see with your pet, they hardly bathe, swim, or interact with water in general. Lucky for them, they don't even need to. These domestic felines use their tongues to clean themselves. They can do this because their tongues have tiny hook-shaped papillae. They assist cats in grooming out knots and keeping the coat clean, sweet-smelling, and in overall mm. immaculate shape. Cats, in general, are individualistic creatures. And you may be screaming at your screen right now proclaiming that your cat, in fact, loves water. And this is definitely possible. Some cats even like to play with water. For example, drips from the tap or bubbles in the bath. There are specific breeds of house cats that are known to enjoy the aqua life more than others. The Turkish Ban, for example, which is also appropriately known as the swimming cat. It's believed that the breed developed an affinity for water by swimming in Lake Van to cool down. This lake is in the area the animals evolved from. Moving on to a problem a cat definitely doesn't have to deal with. Have you ever heard of musophobia, also known as surifobia? Both words are valid names for a fear of mice and rats. There is a common belief that one particular animal that has this fear is the beautiful elephant. That's right, the same animal that, depending on the species, stands at the height of roughly 10 feet and weighs about 9,000 pounds. It's supposedly afraid of a creature that is a mere 4 inches in length and weighs less than one pound. But why did this belief appear? Well, the reasoning for this rumor is based on the possibility that elephants are paranoid about mice climbing inside their trunks. If a mouse succeeded in doing this, there would be a potential that it could cause irritation and blockage within the trunk. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy who spoils parties, but it looks like this belief is also a myth. Researchers claim that there's no concrete evidence that suggests elephants are afraid of mice. The most they'll concede is that the giant animal may sometimes take fright by the sudden appearance of the tiny rodent, which is the exact same for ourselves. Experts also claim that even if a mouse did get inside an elephant's trunk, the latter could effortlessly blow it back out with a puff of air. There's also some evidence that, in most cases, the animal remains unbothered by rodents and even allows mice to climb on their heads and trunks. Researchers are sure that as long as an elephant is healthy, there's no other animal that it fears simply because of its size. So, lions aren't afraid of water, elephants don't seem to be afraid of mice, then are any of these animal fear rumors real? Hmm. We're probably going to be left just as disappointed by asking if a bear has any legit fear, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for none other than people's best friend. That's right, bears do feel quite uncomfortable whenever they are around dogs. And all this despite a very distant genetic link to them. When the two creatures encounter each other, the dog has the ability to chase, intimidate, corner, or antagonize the bear. As for the powerful animal, it will instead try to avoid any run-ins with the dog. There's even a type of Finnish dog breed known as the Karelian bear dog. This dog species is specifically used for standing up to large animals, such as bears. This dog has a great sense of direction, body flexibility, and control, courage, sense of smell, and persistence. So, does this mean you can walk with your dog through an area known to have bears and feel absolutely calm and confident because of the presence of your loyal companion? Not really. Despite the fact that bears may be nervous around dogs, we can't forget their size and power. 
The American black bear can reach a height of nearly 7 feet and weigh up to 660 pounds. If a mother bear has nowhere to run or feels that her cubs might be in danger, it's extremely possible that she will lash out, which can only mean big trouble for you or your dog. So, nobody should ever test this theory. Instead, if you're ever planning to visit an unknown area with your dog, you should first plan ahead and familiarize yourself with the wildlife you may encounter there. Because you never know what a bear will do when it notices you and your pooch, especially given their mild case of xenophobia, which is the name given to a fear of dogs. At least we were able to find one genuine fear of another animal out of these three tough members of the animal kingdom. Weird that a dog, something that gives so many of us such joy and comfort in our own homes, is still the creature that's brave enough to take on a bear if need be. Well, not all heroes wear capes. Some just wear fur and a dog collar. Why don't we take a look at what frightens these great companions of ours? Ever wondered why your own dog becomes uncomfortable when it hears loud noises? The degree of fear differs in each dog, but it's the simple unpredictability of thunder and flashing lightning or loud bangs that accompany firework displays that causes your dog uneasiness. The inability to understand what's causing this deafening noise may cause your dog to tremble, tuck its tail between its legs, or even run away from home. Another thing that can really frighten our loyal pets is when we leave them all alone by themselves. This can, unfortunately, lead to being a nightmare for your next-door neighbors because a common symptom of this fear is excessive barking. This fear may also cause problems closer to home. Ever asked yourself why your dog chewed up your sofa? Housebreaking accidents are typical when a dog has separation anxiety. You can't stay mad at your dog for long though, right? Your pooch will make it up to you when you guys run into a bear. Who do you think will win? A hungry grizzly or a ripe berry? An angry tiger or a beautiful flower? A huge python or a green bush? The answer's not so obvious. Now you'll see who really controls the jungle and forests. Meet the most dangerous plants on Earth. This is the water hemlock. It grows in North America in swampy areas of fields and meadows. Also, you can find this plant on the shores of rivers and streams. It seems harmless, but it's one of the most poisonous plants in the U.S. Water hemlock toxins can cause critical damage to an adult in 15 minutes, but only if you swallow it. Many people mistakenly confuse it with artichoke, celery, and anise. Despite the dangerous poison, water hemlock is used to cure migraines and intestinal diseases. This plant has caused a lot of damage to livestock. White snake root grows in fields and pastures. When a cow bites it, the plant releases a fat-soluble toxin. This poison gets not only inside the animal, but also into the milk. Young calves who drink the milk also become infected. Poisoned milk is also dangerous for people. The problem is that this plant, native to North America, is one of the longest-lived autumn flowers. Now in modern farms, the poison of this plant is not so dangerous, but on small private pastures, white snake root is the number one danger. We all know two kinds of beans, the ones we eat and the ones that Jack used to get to the realm of giants. In addition to them, there are poisonous ones. These are called castor beans. They contain one of the most dangerous toxins in the world, ricin. As soon as it enters your body, it blocks the production of proteins necessary for life. Without these proteins, your cells stop functioning. The more cells are destroyed, the more your body suffers. The castor bean releases ricin when squeezed. Several beans can cause dehydration, weakness, hallucinations, seizures, and other problems. About seven beans are enough to cause critical damage. So remember what they look like and never touch them if you see them in the woods. One of the most beautiful plants on the planet is also one of the most dangerous. This is oleander. Everything is poisonous in it. The stem, the root, and the pink flower. Even a tiny piece of this plant can lead to severe poisoning. It doesn't need to get inside your stomach to create severe problems. Just a little touch to the juice of the flower causes allergies. And don't try to burn it. 
as the smoke of a burning oleander has toxic effects too. And now, the most dangerous plant in the world. One touch of it will hurt you for several years, or you may feel the consequences all your life. The Gimpy Gimpy plant, also called the Queensland Stinger, looks like an ordinary burdock bush. It doesn't look like anything poisonous at all, but if you stand next to this plant, you'll feel suffocation and watery eyes. There are thousands of tiny poisonous hairs on the leaves of this flower. They're so light, they can hang in the air and spread by the wind, so you should put on a gas mask if you want to look at the plant. But if you lightly touch Gimpy Gimpy, you're in big trouble. Some compare one Gimpy Gimpy sting to 30 wasp stings at the same time. Poisonous hairs easily penetrate under your skin and cause irritation and pain. The problem is that you can't pull them out. Wash with soap and water, use some disinfecting ointment, and you'll see that the situation is only worsening. The hairs can't be pulled out of there. They sit there, releasing toxins and driving you crazy. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what components the toxin consists of. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Unpleasant sensations can last for several hours, days, or even months. People who touched the plant said that the pain from the sting returned even after a few years. But if it's impossible to get rid of the hairs, then the only way out is to wait for them to lose their toxicity. But there's another problem here. You can tear off one Gimpy Gimpy leaf with gloves and put it in the laboratory, dry it, and forget about it for a few years. And here it lies in front of you, a withered, almost destroyed leaf. It seems harmless, but it's not. Even after many years, the poisonous hairs remain on the leaf surface and still cause toxin effects. Gimpy Gimpy only grows in Australia. It loves the sun and dense green forests. It used to pose a severe danger to tourists and loggers. But now, all places with this plant are marked with a warning sign. At botanical exhibitions, scientists put this plant in a cage so people wouldn't touch it. Rosary peas can be white seeds with a black eye or black seeds with a white eye. You can find these plants in Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Ocean region. Some species were transported to Florida and Hawaii by people. You could encounter this plant even on city streets. Rosary pea seeds are used in jewelry and some toys. People who wear rosary pea bracelets probably don't know about its seeds toxicity. Rosary peas, as well as the castor bean, contribute to the destruction of cells. Interestingly, rosary pea seeds are used not only as decorations, but also for healing certain health conditions. This is the only poisonous plant from the list that looks poisonous. You probably won't want to pick it up when you notice it. See this red stem that looks more like an artery or an enlarged nervous system? And those berries are similar to eyes. Doll's eye looks a little creepy. Their internal structure is also as unpleasant as their appearance. Doll's eye has a dangerous toxin. The longer they grow, the more poisonous their composition gets. Doll's eye chemicals have a sedative effect on muscles and hearts. This means that your body relaxes so much that it stops working. You've probably seen this plant in reality or wildlife movies. Venus flytraps are rare representatives of carnivorous plants. Fortunately, they're not as dangerous for humans as for insects. But in any case, you shouldn't stick your finger in them. So here's how they work. The plant opens its mouth. There's a red petal with a fragrant smell in its middle. It's a decoy. A fly or some beetle notices this and decides to try it. They climb inside the flower. But the Venus flytrap doesn't immediately get closed. Tiny sensitive hairs inside the plant count the movements of the fly. If the fly has made more than two movements within 20 seconds, the plant closes its mouth in less than a second. This interval prevents the Venus flytrap from needlessly slamming when some garbage lands there. Then the fly becomes trapped. The bristles on the plant's jaws work like a cage. Prey cannot escape. Then the Venus flytrap injects digestive juice into its mouth, which destroys the fly. 
5 to 12 days later, the plant opens again and waits for a new lunch. The Venus flytrap can eat flies, beetles, spiders, and even little frogs. Giant hogweed causes the most extensive damage among all plants. It's dangerous not specifically for one person, but for entire forests and fields. Giant hogweed is an invasive plant. It's like a parasite. It multiplies quickly and destroys all other flowers in the area. Insects don't feed on giant hogweed. It's also problematic for people to destroy it, since giant hogweed causes an allergic reaction on the skin. It grows quickly, it's immune to poisons, and lives long. Giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story house and be deeply rooted in the ground. It releases its seeds, and a light breeze spreads them for miles. Scientists still can't create an effective way to combat it. There's nothing that can defeat giant hogweed in nature. Well, not yet. Nature and evolution always find a balance. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.